Hello everyone, my name is Dan and I make content about competitive Warhammer 40k. Today we're going to be talking about the deployment phase and how to master it. Over the past weekend I was watching Charity Hammer and I saw a couple games where top tier ITC pros actually conceded on turn 1 because they had messed up their deployment so much. So in this mission we'll be going about how to analyze the terrain and mission for deployment, pre-game questions you should ask your opponent every single game, different deployment phase tips, as well as walk through an example deployment phase. It can be really hard to understand what's going on in a game of Warhammer 40k based on the pictures, so what I've done is I've made graphics to simplify it all, but please let me know if you have any other feedback or tips. So today we're going to be looking at the overrun mission. This is a hold 2, hold 3, hold more mission, so that means you need to be holding at least two objectives to get five points a turn. What I've done is I've replaced the objective markers with big white circles that show the three inches that you can be near an objective to be able to control it. So after a mission is picked, you then put terrain on the board. The terrain I'm going to be using is based off of tournaments I've gone to, as well as the advice that Games Workshop puts out in their own tournament packets. So for example, we're going to put six different pieces of ruins that are kind of symmetrical along a diagonal here. Okay, now that we've placed a few ruins, we'll place a couple of forests, some containers to help break up the right and left sides of the map, and then also some craters. I like this type of terrain because there's plenty of pieces of obscuring terrain, and also an a interesting variety of different terrain pieces, and it's not all just ruins. If you get shot off the board by an admech gun line, it could be that your deployment sucks, but it could also be you're playing on a map that doesn't have nearly enough terrain. My recommendation to you is that if you're playing a game that doesn't have at least 8 pieces of obscuring terrain, you probably need more terrain on your map. Okay, now if I showed you a list on the top right, how would you describe it to me? Many people might say, oh, that's John Lennon's Ultramarine list. It's got Intercessors, Incursors, Invictors, Landspeeder Storms, Contemptor Dreadnoughts, Redemptor Dreadnoughts, blah blah blah. But Warmer 40k is so complicated and there are so many different types of armies, units, warlord traits, and stratagems that it's too much for one person to truly be able to take all in. So instead of looking at this unit for all its different pieces, let's try to describe it in a simple sentence. So when I look at this list, I see it as a durable gunline castle that can forward deploy, redeploy, and dishes out lots of damage to weapons as well as mortal wounds. Now this is different from, say, a Drukhari army, which is able to spread around, move very quickly, and dishes out D3 plus 3 damage attacks. And to be able to get these kind of rule of thumbs of what an army can do, here's a few questions I like to ask. So to understand our enemy, we first have to understand their goals. What type of secondaries are they going to be taking? Are they going to be staying in their deployment zone, or are they going to try to push out into yours? Do they need to stay together to get all their buffs, or can they be really spread out? Every single game, I ask my opponent the same three questions, unless I already know the answer. The first one is, do you have any ability to do redeployments? For example, the Ultramarines have a 2CP stratagem called Rapid Redeployment, which allows them to pick up three different units on the battlefield, remove them, and then redeploy them. Now this is incredibly powerful when you pair them with something like an Invictor Tactical Warsuit, which is able to forward deploy. The Warsuits could be put in an incredibly aggressive position, and then if the Ultramarine player goes second, it just picks him up and puts him right back into his backfield. So you need to know if your opponent has stratagems or abilities like this. The next is any pregame moves. Necrons have an ability to do an entire army-wide 6-inch pregame move, whereas Blood Angels have an ability for a Death Company unit to move 12 inches before a game starts. You want to look at the most important pieces of your opponent's army and ask what their max threat ranges are. I don't care if it can move and then advance and then double move. I care how many inches can it move across the board and make an attack. Okay, now that we've understood our enemy and kind of analyzed the opponent's list before the game has even started, we can also go to start analyzing the match. And this can never be done in a vacuum. The way a Blood Angel player like myself would play against that same Ultramarines list is very different than a Tau list would play against them. 
So here's where I ask everyone here who's watching this video to be an active participant, whether that means commenting below or just thinking out loud to yourself, how would you analyze the matchup against that very popular Ultramarines list? And one of the first questions I like to ask is, who is the aggro in this match? In every game of Warhammer 40k, there is someone who would win if neither player did anything. And the extreme example of this is Dark Angels. So they have a few really important secondaries. One is To The Last, which gives you 15 victory points if you have your three highest cost units alive at the end of the game. The next one is Stubborn Defense, where they pick a backfield objective like this one, and they get cumulative points for every turn they hold it with an obsec unit. And finally, raise their banners high, getting a point every turn for each banner they've raised. And in a mission like Overrun, they could easily get these back three in their deployment zone for three points a turn. If that Dark Angels player never moved out of their deployment zone and never made a single attack, they would end the game with 95 points. Now you can think that's stupid all you want or bad game design, but the fact of the matter is that's how the game works. So if you get matched up against that Dark Angels player who picks those secondaries, you have to go towards them, otherwise you will lose. So it's not just who has melee or ranged attacks, but rather who would win if no one did anything. And then the second question I like to ask is where are the key pieces of terrain? So for example, because I play a army of close combat Blood Angels units, I like to leapfrog between obscuring pieces of terrain. So for example, you can see there's a few locations from my deployment zone where I can try to leap up to the containers or the ruin on the right to try to hide myself from my opponent's gunfire. Once I get to these key pieces of terrain, I'm able to jump out and attack my opponent's objectives as well as where their castle might be towards the middle of the map. So now I understand both my enemy as well as the matchup. Now let's go into some more specific tips. The biggest number one tip I have for you guys is to smash that subscribe and like button. It helps my content get out to a wider audience as well as also keeps you aware of any new videos and tactics videos I put out. So these ruins will say that they have little cracks in them and little windows on the first floor. You can see through them if you're in the terrain. So now let's say I put a few of my models inside this ruin and we'll say that blue is up north to the top. Is this positioning good or bad? And in my opinion, this positioning is actually terrible. And there's a few reasons why. So what I've done is I've put a few examples of where blue units could be to take advantage of red's poor positioning and kind of labeled them one through three. So because red is touching the terrain and there are windows on the first floor, blue one is able to see and shoot red's models. Blue 2 is able to attack through the ruins and attack Red's models because Red's models are within one inch of the edge of the terrain. Additionally, there are spaces where Blue's models can actually end up inside the ruin and can also make melee attacks against Red. So Red's positioning was actually quite bad and Blue is able to take advantage of it in multiple different ways. Let's look at a much better way for Red to deploy. So now Red has spread out a little bit. Because he's not touching the terrain, and because the ruins are obscuring, Blue 1 cannot see or shoot any of Red's models. Additionally, you can see that Blue 2 cannot get within 1 inch of any Red models and can't attack. And Blue 3 is not able to actually fit inside the ruin because their base does not fit. So Red had to make a very deliberate effort to prevent Blue from taking advantage of the positioning. What Red has to do is play by intent and clearly announce how they're setting up their units in this ruin. One inch is 25 millimeters. Generally the smallest bases are 32 millimeters. As long as you stay further than 25 millimeters from the ruin and closer than 32, nobody can attack you through the ruin and nobody can fit their models inside of the ruin. And this means that if blue wanted to charge red, they would actually have to go much further and all the way around to fit their models in. You need to be playing by intent and announce that intent. If you don't announce your intent and you think you're trying to do something well and then you don't do it perfectly, your opponent is well within their right to take advantage of your mistake when you play by intent, you can't completely disregard reality, but just saying, hey, I'm putting all my guys here spread out so that I'm further than one inch away and there's no 32 millimeter gap. That will save you a lot of headaches. One thing I really like about chess is the idea of inactive pieces. 
So for example, in chess, bishops move on diagonals and you can't move through your own models, right? So this bishop that we have here is pretty bad because it's not attacking any of white's pieces and have to spend multiple turns to get into the game. Now chess has all these complicated rules about line of sight and I go, you go activations that us warmer 40k players don't understand. But we do understand the importance of nullifying a unit. If a unit is dead or not attacking me, it's very similar. So let's look at how we can nullify units in a game of Warhammer 40k. The first is simply blocking line of sight. If a unit cannot see you, it cannot shoot you. You can do this by using obscuring terrain. Number two is staying out of threat ranges. If a unit has a max threat range of 30 inches like Van a White Scar's Vanguard veteran unit, then as long as you stay and say that you're 30.1 inches away from that unit, they cannot charge you at all. And once you realize that and are able to ask your opponent what is the max threat range and you stay out of that max threat range, you are at the intermediate level of Warhammer 40k. But there's a much more advanced way of thinking about threat ranges and I'd like to talk with you about that. So let's look at an example of a Salamander's Tactical Marine with a, with a bolter clearly labeled and a White Scar's Vanguard vet on the bottom. Uh, once more guys, not accepting commissions, uh, you have to go through my OnlyFans for that. So these two models are 30 inches away, and my question for the Salamanders player is, do you want to be 30.1 inches away, or do you want to be 29.1 inches away? So we know that, that Salamanders Tack Marine moves 6 inches and has a 24 inch range bolter. So his threat range is 30 inches, whereas the White Scar's Vanguard Vet also has a max threat range of 30 inches with advancing and charging getting 3 sixes on all of their rolls. And the key here in making this decision is based on probability. The Salamander can always move 6 inches and will always attack 24 inches away, giving them a 100% success rate if they deploy 29.1 inches away. Whereas the Vanguard Vet will have a 10% successful charge if they're 29.1 inches away. So the Salamander player here has to do a risk reward calculation. Is it worth getting a 100% chance to shoot at the Vanguard Vets? and taking a 10% chance they get charged? And I think the answer to that is almost always yes. If you think that type of calculation is interesting or you don't believe me, then please check out my advanced 2d6 dice math video where I go into these type of topics much more in depth. Finally, the third way to keep your units safe is to hide them in deep strike or reserve. This is really popular for certain units like Magnus, for example, because he can't be obscured and you want to make sure that you're getting all your psychic powers off before your opponent has a chance to attack. And sometimes the only way you can do that is being in reserve. And if you can't do one, two, or three, then my suggestion is you only offer up dispensable units. Keep your important guys safe and then offer your chaff units up to die. Unless you're playing a very elite army, you will probably lose some models on turn one. You probably won't be able to hide everything, and that's okay. If you can hide everything, then it's possible there might be too much line of sight blocking terrain on your board. Okay, now let's go back to our Ultramarines example and look at how the deployment phase actually works. So the deployment phase starts with both players picking secondaries at the same time and revealing them simultaneously. And because we've analyzed the opponent's list, it's no surprise when they take Raise the Banners High, Oath of Moments, and Engage on All Fronts. And then step two is determining the attacker and defender. So the way this works is both players roll off, and then the person who gets the highest roll decides who will be the attacker and who will be the defender. The defender then chooses the side they want and will be the first person to deploy. Now this is important to think about because the person who wins this roll off gets to choose who deploys first or second. That's very different than step six, rolling for who goes first, because if you win the roll off on going first, you have to go first. This is the only time you get to make a choice. So now the defender chooses their deployment zone and both players at the same time will declare their reserve or transports. So before you start deploying anything, you have to say all your guys are gonna be in strategic reserve, transports or deep strike. And then after that, the defender will start by placing their model on the board and they'll alternate with the attacker, each placing one unit on the board at a time. Both players will roll off and the winner has to go first. After that, everyone is able to do their pregame actions, starting with the active player or the player who's going first. Now for this example, I'll use my Blood Angels. However, I do implore you guys to think about your own list and how you would deploy against the Ultramarines. 
You have to be an active learner if you're trying to get better at something. Just consuming YouTube content is great for me, but I want you guys to get better. And the only way you're going to get better is by really thinking through these problem sets. So I think I can hide a good portion of my list, and I also want to make sure that my eradicators get into a good firing position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my eradicators as well as my inceptors in deep strike and reserve. Now let's go to the actual alternating deployment. So whenever I'm thinking about deployment, my first goal is to seize those important pieces of terrain, delay important deployment decisions by placing chaff units first, and then finally place critical units in advantageous positions. Those are my three steps for deploying. If you ever listen to other people's videos, they almost always only talk about two and three because it comes with the assumption that you can only deploy in your deployment zone. And that's just not the case. If both players have units like Incursors and Invictor Tactical Warsuits that can deploy in the midfield, it's actually very important who gets to deploy first. For example, let's say I end up being selected as a defender, and then I place my unit of incursors in that key ruin that I talked about earlier. Now no enemy can deploy within nine inches of that. So if my opponent went first, they actually could have deployed their incursors or tactical war suits there and denied my ability to deploy in that ruin. That's very important. So step one, seize important terrain. Then we'll go back and forth with my opponent placing their invictors in a pretty aggressive positioning because they have that capability of redeploying them later. And then I'll move on to step two here where I put an intercessor in my backfield trying to delay this decision of where I'm going to put my sanguinary guard and death company because those are my most important pieces. My opponent sadly has more units than I though and they can place things like this 30 point unit of servitors in their backfield objective. And we'll just continue this on until I've deployed all of my models. So you can see that after I've deployed all my units, the Ultramarine's opponent actually still has seven different units to deploy. That's partially because he had more drops with cheaper units. I mean, everything in the Blood Angels army is overpriced anyway, but the Ultramarines had, had more units and I put things into Deep Strike and Reserve and that reduced my number of drops. That allowed him to delay the decision of where he was going to place the very important pieces like Redemptor Dreadnoughts and Contemptor Dreadnoughts, which do an incredible amount of firepower. This gives the Ultramarine player the opportunity. Where do they want to deploy this Gunline Castle? They can go all the way to the right and take advantage of the fact that I'm clearly trying to take that right ruin. Or they could deploy more centrally based on what they want. I think they would go more centrally based on the fact they have Oath of Moment and they're already going to cream me anyway because it's John Lennon. So now everyone has deployed and it now goes to pregame actions. We'll also say for this example that we roll off now and I win the roll off and I'm forced to go first. But the good news is I wanted to go first, right? So I will get to move my death company and I'll move them 12 inches up the board. Maybe I can try to do something against these contemptor dreadnoughts and wrap them into combat on turn one. But now the Ultramarine player gets to choose their pregame movements. And what they're going to do is spend that 2 CP and redeploy their Invictor Tactical Warsuits. So they were able to be incredibly aggressive with their deployment to start. And as soon as he found out he was going second, yoink those things right back to his deployment zone. I think I was able to do an okay job. I protected almost all my troops from being shot on turn one, and I set them up in a location where I'll be safe if I go second, and I'll be able to take advantage of getting to those key pieces of terrain if I go first. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. And I really hope this video helped you understand the complexities of the deployment phase and how important it is to get it right. I really thank you guys for all your support. I'm almost to a thousand subscribers, and I hope we continue to grow and teach everyone how to be better at the game of Warhammer 40k. Have a wonderful day.